Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is um, the third episode from our Great Change, Great Women series, and we're waiting for a couple more minutes to get more um, guests to enter the room, and we will start very shortly. Thank you. And one more minute, if that's okay. We will start promptly at two minutes past two. Okay, welcome everybody. And uh, my name is Nasser Siabi. I'm the chief executive of Microlink. And I'd like to welcome everyone to this great um, episode three. Our um, guest today is Shani Danda. And I'm sure most of you know her. If you don't, then certainly uh, you should. Uh, she's an amazing lady and she's been so active um, in the diversity, inclusion, and disability. Um, space for, for quite a long time. And it's a privilege to have such high um, powered people in our, in our presence because we, we, we will definitely learn a lot from her experience. So over to Anna to give you a, uh, some housekeeping um, and then we'll, we can start. Hello everybody, episode three. The weeks are whizzing by. Hope everybody's okay. Um, anyway, welcome. To our, to our latest uh, offering, we've got Shani. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about her and also a little bit of housekeeping. So there will be a Q&A at the end, so please put any questions in the chat. Please be respectful to all others. We want everyone to feel welcome, so safe and respected. Accessibility features is we have a captioning service um, by My Clear Text. Thank you for providing the captioning. Switch on the captioning at the bottom of the Zoom screen, closed captioning, show subtitles. Um, and you can follow the conversation on Twitter, uh, which is hashtag Great Change Great Women. So, Shani is an award-winning disability specialist um, and social entrepreneur listed as one of the UK's most influential disabled people and BBC's 100 Women 2020 list. That's, that's really something if you think about it, that there's 68 million people in the country and she's in the one top 100. Hmm. As a keynote speaker and practitioner for inclusion across business, government, nonprofit and wider society, Shani helps organizations break barriers and integrate inclusion into their business frameworks. With a determination for creating everyday equality, Shani founded and leads three disruptive platforms, all united by the common purpose of empowering underrepresented communities. Passionate about representation and betrayal, betrayal, I need to put, betrayal, then sorry, portrayal of intersectionality, Shani is the face of LinkedIn's first ever TV ad, which was featured across digital, print, and radio channels with over 17 million views. 
She is a LinkedIn change maker and sits within the top 0.09% most influential members in the UK. Shani has worked at Virgin Media for three years, helping to transform the experience of their disabled employees and customers. She's also a trustee of global disability charity, Lena Cheshire, and vice president of the Asian Business Chamber of Commerce. As a subject matter expert, Shani brings the voices of disabled people and their organizations to policy development for the government's disability unit and uh, the, at the cabinet office. She is an ambassador at the Valuable 500 and Parallel London. When do you sleep? <laughs> Anna, you've said it all now, I can go. <laughs> I want to joke here. Uh, yeah, they're very sleep deprived. Got lots of grey hair, <laughs> but no, just, I, I really enjoy it. I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how you fit it all in. I mean, <laughs> we're busy, but that's just yeah. I think um, I think a lot of it doesn't feel like work. Um, it like never is um, when it's your passion. Yeah, I'm very, very mm. passionate about this. Very passionate about inclusion and. I think I'm very motivated by all the experiences, the good and the bad that I've had uh, growing up. And I, I just really want to be the part of the change that I want to see for others. Uh, and there's, there's so much to be done. And, and I've, got, I've got so many more ideas, but I have to tell myself, no, focus on, focus on what you've started and do that. And then, and then move on to whatever else it is that you want to do. You didn't yeah, even uh, mention the studies yet. But, oh, yes, you know, the studies. Gonna... I was going to actually say that at, at the end. Okay, the, yeah, yeah. The, I'm the, saying that. She's got, obviously, she's got spare time. Otherwise. Yeah, because, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, what would she do? I mean, she, you know, she's not going to sit down and watch Netflix, is she? So, <laughs> no, she, so Charlie's actually got... studying for an MBA, aren't you? I am. I am for yeah. my Unbelievable. <laughs> so she's got enormous capacity uh, to, to make the world mm -hmm. a better place. So. Hence, we want to hear from her. Thank you yeah. for being passionate, with us today. Passionate. So, first question. What do you spend most of your time doing? <laughs> <laughs> you seem to be everywhere, Sean. Um, I, I think if I had to sum it up, because look, I wear a lot of hats, as you've just mentioned. If I had to sum it up, I would say I spend a lot of my time working with organisations, government, and, and in wider society. Um, helping people understand what inclusion means, understand that you know it's an, it's an action, what that looks like, advocating for disabled people, um, and and I think especially with business, I'm I'm helping them um, retain amazing talent, be more inclusive, be more productive. Uh, and, and do the right thing and, and to value the customers that they serve and to value their employees. So that, uh, you know, if I had to sum it up, I, I'd, I'd sum it up like that. But, um, and, and, you know, it's amazing all of the opportunities that I've been afforded recently, you know, LinkedIn. I was in the census advert as well. I saw you, I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. impressed. <laughs> but it, it just it means the world. I know from being really honest, you know, I, I grew up, I'm, of growing up really without without seeing myself or any of my identities ever being represented all of them together and and when I say that I mean you know someone who is uh, of an underrepresented ethnicity has a visible condition and, and is a woman I've never seen that and it wasn't until I was at the LinkedIn advert and saw myself on screen I actually Found that representation yeah. and, and in one way it's bittersweet like it, it's amazing that I have the opportunity but should it have taken me to do that like it can't just be my responsibility um so yeah that, that, that's what I do <laughs> so you, you've been you've been doing this for a while but what was your entry point into the world of uh, disability inclusion yeah so I'm actually on like my third career now so um I never grew up with an aspiration to work in this space of disability or inclusion or advocacy. Um, I, I first was a nursery nurse for a few years. I love kids. I loved uh, doing that. And also... Not mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, not anymore. Not anymore. Um, and they loved me too, actually. So I used to work with three to four-year-olds and we'd all be the same height. So I have a short stature. I'm three foot ten. And uh, <laughs> this is not hanging out with me. Um, and I thought maybe, 
maybe I was just a bit less intimidating than like the taller uh, teachers or nurses and nurses. I don't know, but it was great. But I do got pretty complacent and I was like, actually, I don't want to spend the rest of my life doing this. Then I went into event management. I did that for 10 years and I've organised probably any type of event you can think of and then some. And I've had incredible clients such as Anthony Joshua, who wow. I marry, Tyson Fury, Floyd Mayweather. Like I've done the most random events ever and I've, I loved it. And then I hit 30 and I was like, I can't do 18 hours in heels anymore so uh you know but actually alongside uh working as an event manager i i guess i was finding my voice as a as an activist a disability activist i've always been someone who's always been quite outspoken mm-hmm. um and that's been quite difficult being someone who is south asian and being brought up in a big south asian community because actually that's seen as something that people should do especially women mm-hmm. um so yeah I, I don't know I've always had the courage to say what I've needed to say want to say and I think you know my dad uh, always taught me that you know if you can be a voice for others who don't have one then you should you should use it uh so yeah so actually I, I wanted nothing to do with disability right. uh, in my early growing up in my teenagers and it wasn't until my early 20s when I discovered the social model of disability Mm. I just felt like this massive weight had been lifted off my shoulders a weight that I didn't even know was there and I I often when I think why so I was born with a rare genetic condition only 5,000 people in the UK live with this condition it meant that my bones are liable to break without any trauma so my entire childhood was literally spent in hospital I went to special needs school I was I was very medicalized and what you know I I absolutely adore the NHS I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the NHS I'm not saying that that was bad but I'm saying that there just wasn't the balance of the social elements of it in, in addition to the medical and then when you lay on top of that my ethnicity like south the south asian lens disability faces an even further sense of stigma so so mm. growing up i was just told oh from the medical world you're a spontaneous mutation because this, this condition doesn't run in my family and then in my culture i was just told oh you did something bad in your past life wow. and i was like well that's a bit mean like I, I don't even I don't even know now if I even believe in past lives and all I don't I don't know but then suddenly yeah I just felt that like I just had all this guilt that yeah, other people were making they, 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 and then I discovered the social model which yeah. says actually it's the barriers and bias that you face in society which is what disables you and it just made perfect sense Shani, Shani I think you were great you must have been very good in a past life because look at what you're doing now yeah but oh look at what you're doing now so if there is anything you know to do with your culture and, and yeah people around you saying these things I mean, I've heard this before I mean I, yeah. I, I live 20 odd years in Greece and um, yeah. they say strange things yeah. also you know if you're if you're born with anything anything mm. not normal mm. And that's something that you've done in a past life or somebody's done, mm-hmm. given you the evil eye or, you know, the mother's yeah. sinned or something yeah. like this. Very strange thing. And I look and I, I totally respect everybody's beliefs, but I think it's it's just something else when you then put that on other people because mm. then it suddenly became my burden to bear and I didn't want that. So, yeah, no. the social model literally changed my life and then it also gave me hope that actually through education, through changing people's mindsets, that we can do something here, we can make the world more more equitable, a more, you know, fairer place to live for those that aren't experiencing that at the moment. Who are differently abled. Oh, I like yeah, that. I don't, I don't like that term. <laughs> oh, you don't like it? Differently I don't like abled? That term, yeah. Because oh, I, I thought this, this was the new phrase. I you're think not disabled, you're differently abled. I just think we're all differently abled. Being right handed or left handed is differently abled. I, and can I just say, I think, I, I get why people are saying that. I think I think people are trying to make disability more palatable, but disability isn't a bad word. No. And 
disability is just an experience because basically you're either born with or you acquire a condition or an impairment and disability yeah. is what we do to people so it's not a bad word so actually anyone listening don't say differently abled just say disabled. yeah no no no. don't apologize because we're all learning um this there's what like i used to say abled so i did but now i know the right thing to say is non-disabled oh it's non-learning and and look no, I've gone from not wanting anything to do with disability to now representing the voices of a lot of people. So it's a journey. And, and, and as my journey changes, so does my understanding, my language, my experience. Don't apologise. Oh, no, I've way. read it recently. That's why. And I thought, oh, yeah. well, that's... that's but it, it, the choice of vocabulary good. is actually important in a context sometimes yeah. because um, we are looking at disability means you can't do something. But that could be uh, per perfectly uh, uh, fine individual with no conditions could be disabled because of the situation, because of mm -hmm. the, the way things are, are done. I mean, the whole pandemic taught us that suddenly overnight millions of people became disabled yeah. because the things they were able to do suddenly uh, stopped working. So, so I think the name disability is useful to have. As someone said, it's a focus that we can talk about the subject. We can talk about the exclusions, but certainly it's not what defines the individuals who are considered disabled. Mm -hmm. I, I was born with a genetic condition of eyesight and for years I failed my education, not because I wasn't intelligent, mm -hmm. it's because it wasn't really accessible. Yeah. When okay. that was resolved, I managed to show that anyone is capable of reaching the highest accolades in education. Yeah. And I'm sure lots of people who are capable are missing out because they've just not had the opportunity. So yeah. I don't think disability is a bad word, but it has to be defined in a context yeah. of where you are applying it to. Yeah. So autistic people might not be disabled because of their capabilities, but in a situation where we put them into a, a very typical um, in, employment environment, then they are disabled because we don't understand their needs. We don't give them yeah. what they need. Right, that's that. And if we looked at it from that lens, then everyone everyone has some form of disability, right? Totally. I think it's just, we just need to focus on what people can do instead of focusing on what people can't do. And I think traditionally, that's always been the approach. It's what can't you do? What's the deficit? Uh, we know we're all different. We all have unique traits, abilities that make us unique. And I love that. I, I think that's brilliant. And I think we just have to, we as a society, we need to make people feel that they can be that, they can be their whole self. Because I know that there are people out there that feel conscious that they can't be, because it's not cool to be, what will people say, what will my employers say. So yeah, I think it's, it's, it's everyone's responsibility to, um, to just, yeah, get over it and, and, and get, get, with it. get comfortable <laughs> with feeling uncomfortable about things, I, I say. That, how you define a problem is really uh, depends on the situation. So here you have a problem, a single problem, which is called disability and exclusion. And if you don't have that word, you don't know how to concentrate mm -hmm. your energies and your efforts to try to re resolve or remove those barriers. So, so as you said, there's no need to apologize for using mm -hmm. different terms. You know, uh, you know, we are all different. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, to me, working in a um, environment where um, uh, somebody has um, no hearing, yeah. I could be disadvantaged just because I can hear. Okay, so I mean, here I can't concentrate too much noise. Yet, if somebody who's got no hearing, we can get on with their work. So, who is disabled here? So, I think we've got to be very careful not to marginalize people based on their condition, but we should talk about how it impacts them in, a, in an environment, the situation they're yeah. in. I think it's great. And just, just to guess to, to sum this up, I think it's important to remember that disability can be permanent, it can be temporary, it can be situational, you know, so it's not a fixed fixed thing. I'm not disabled 24 mm seven. -hmm. I only experience disability when I'm faced with a barrier or a bias. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, you know, and, and, and we, and the decisions that we all make, they can either raise or lower the, the, the mm. barriers to participation. That's why it's everyone's responsibility. Mm. Mm. Uh, and mm. I think one thing is the people who are in charge or 
with people who can make change often need to know what they have to do in order for the problem to go away. Yeah. And hence, I think when you're talking to these, um, um, let's say, employers, and then you start talking about people who have a condition, the only time they really want to do something is, okay, is that condition affecting how they work? So here is where you can bring disability, saying there are lots of people disabled for different reasons, and the way you get more out of your people is to make these changes in your organization. That's a much easier conversation than to actually get them to change the culture of how they see disabled people because we all have that thing inherent bias in our in our in our own self thinking mm -hmm. you know somebody can't do a certain job because they have whatever background so i think when you start spelling out what the solutions look like then you find the barriers disappear because people are willing to make those changes yeah and that's why i really love working with you all at microlink because that's, you get it. You don't need to focus on people's medical history, their medical condition. What is the barrier that they're experiencing that's not maybe um, allowing them to do their role to the best ability? Let's remove it. Simple as. That's it. It's not difficult. And I feel that, you know, you're you're all on the same page, as am I. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and I know that we've got experience in this, but, um, yeah, I, that's why I really love working with people. Thank you. No, I, we just had a comment. Um, management of pain is a huge issue in addition to the actual disability when it comes to participation in society. So that's, yeah, Very true. there's a disability, but also the management of pain that, that can be. Oh, my God. I, I say mm -hmm. managing my condition is like having another job in itself. Yeah. Like, you're absolutely right. And especially if you've got a condition that fluctuates 100%. Mm -hmm. That's why flexibility, trust is really key. I'm going to ask you a question about COVID now. Um, I dreaded COVID. So what has changed for you over the last year? And how do you think the pandemic has influenced disability inclusion? Um, so let's go back to March, early March 2019, when we knew very little about COVID, but it was this horrible virus that was coming to the UK. Um, and I actually started to shield a week before the lockdown because because of my condition, I have a reduced lung capacity, I have a suppressed immune system. So I just thought, you know what, it's in my best interest that I take some precaution, even though we didn't know what we know now. Um, and I have to say, I was only able to do that because I have a really supportive employer, Virgin Media. Um, so I work there for two days a week and I do everything else on all the other days. Um, but and they, you know, they've always been supportive through everything, not just COVID. But you know, it, it, I feel so privileged to be able to say that. And I've worked remotely since then, um, and there's no pressure on me to go back. You know, it's all when I feel safe and want to. And it's not just for me; it's actually the whole organisation. Mm. Um, you know, and overnight contact centre staff working from home so that's never ever ever happened before um and actually we've we've been a very much more productive organization as a result but personally even though i took every single precaution i'd never even used to go out for daily exercise i never even used to open my post or the parcels on the day they came and wait like two or three days i still caught covid in june um so actually sitting here today i feel very lucky to be alive especially because six out of 10 deaths in relation to COVID were those of people with pre-existing conditions. Yeah. And then yeah. the added vulnerability that I am South Asian, so the ethnicity um, factor as well. And actually, I do, do you know this, but disabled women, I think, are 11 times more likely to die from COVID. Like, wow, that's shocking. That, so, that is shocking. Yeah, like, I'm just glad to be here, if I'm being honest. Um, We're very glad that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think at first, my first thought was asymptomatic, but I did have a sore throat. But when you break your bone regularly without any trauma, a sore throat is nothing in comparison to breaking bones. So I just thought I haven't been anywhere. I haven't, there's no way I could have got COVID. And I don't know how I got it, but. Um, so it was pretty asymptomatic, then the fatigue hit me, then everything else. And then actually a couple of months later, then I then developed uh, breathing difficulties and everything because then I got long COVID. But 
I'm okay. I feel I feel fine now. Like I wouldn't say a hundred percent. I say ninety percent. But like I'm just so grateful that I'm here. I've been able to work. I've been supported not only by my employer but my family, my friends, by yourself. You know, everyone's checked in on me. Um. So yeah, that that yeah. that's been my experience. Well, that proves my point. You are a force of nature. <laughs> so, you know, you've managed to overcome all this and you're mm. growing stronger as well. So that's that's a really amazing story. And I, I, I do understand the impact of COVID has been absolutely devastating for uh, to the disabled community. And mm. many people have lost their loved ones. And, and I think the impact is going to carry on. Long COVID is a certainly a problem here to stay. And that's really a good, a good point to segue into when we go back to new normal, how do we keep focused on this important issue? Because now that we've got people who weren't disabled, now they're going to have long-term impact of COVID. Mm -hmm. They're no different to people who had that problem before. So mm -hmm. I know the problem becomes too big. Then sometimes people, you know, you don't blame them, but they mm -hmm. stop taking action. They stop trying to remedy the situation because they think it's too big overwhelming and we can't do anything about it but how do we keep this whole disability this adjustment this mm -hmm. the way that our employers should be able to um, uh, harness all the um, all the potential you know the, um, talent of all the workforce front and center of the uh, operation not just give up and say we've got bigger problems to deal Absolutely. with yeah i think that's such a great question and i just want to start by saying um i feel like everyone felt some sort of disablement through the pandemic and the lockdown. You know, people who never used to have to think about going out, you know, were then suddenly not allowed to go anywhere. And actually that's a lot of disabled people's everyday reality. Some people can't even get out of their, their bed, their front door. They can't get into certain buildings or when they get there, then the, um, the, the, the service that they get is, is awful. So um, I, I I just, yeah, I just want to start by saying, I think everyone now has experienced some type of disability, but I feel like what was really infuriating was all the accommodations and adjustments and flexibility that we saw throughout the pandemic was just turned on overnight, whereas disabled people were asking for this, advocating for this mm -hmm. for many, many, many years. And actually, some of the things that have now been introduced will, will have meant that there will have been less people that were unemployed with disabilities. It, 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 would just, it, it just would have changed so many things if people all thought the way that they're thinking now, pre-pandemic, but it's only because it started to affect the majority of the population. Mm -hmm. But what people don't realise is the prevalence of disability. So, you know, we know it affects one in five people, that's 22% of the UK population. And actually, out of 14 million disabled people, 80% have acquired their condition or impairment. So even though disability discriminates, uh, even though if you, if you have a disability, you will experience discrimination, disability doesn't discriminate who it affects. And I think we're not, I think people are just going through this, through life being completely, I'm not ignorant and, and and I know why like if it's not if it's not in your world if it's not if, it, if you don't know somebody maybe if you don't work with someone it, you might not even think about it and especially because we have very poor representation of disability on screen in films in books in the news I think I think it's just this big compounding issue, but then suddenly it affected everybody. And then that's where we saw everyone being more compassionate, being more empathetic, calling in on each other, uh, going to get people shopping, you know, and I want that to stay. I, we really need that to stay because, you know, we know that now the shielding um, restrict the guidance has been lifted, but, 75% of disabled people are still planning to shield, but now it's going to be without all of that support mm. because then suddenly the majority have been advised to just go back out there into society. Mm. So then what that means is disabled people were forgotten before the pandemic, during the pandemic and after the pandemic. Mm. And how can it be that we didn't learn any lessons? And how could it be 
how can it be that we just go back to this old way of working where there's just so much exclusion you know it's mm. just yeah so, um, but, 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 but we've got to actually bring back all the positives mm. we learned over the past year and yeah keep focusing on those and i think this uh, issue of overnight we managed to work from home i i personally have seen improvement in my productivity threefold at least because mm -hmm. i know i have time to do i have time to walk around and relax yeah. and then come back and do my work and i think yeah. that's something that employees now should take note yeah absolutely. as you quite rightly say shielding people they can still do their job. We still have access to the technology and connectivity that we could make people do what they're paid to do. Yeah, and I, you know, I mentioned it before. I think it does come down to flexibility and to trust. You know, I know there's some employers out there that are saying um, it's up to you whether you want to work from home permanently or you want to come in one day a week, whatever. And I know some employers have like closed their offices. Um, I think. I think it's important to note that a blanket approach just isn't going to suit every single person. Um, that's why, you know, my, my best advice is that you have to be flexible. There are some people where the, the home isn't a safe space, so they, they do need to come to an office. Um, there are some people where actually they might not be able to get all of the adjustments they need in their home, or they just want to be in the office. So, you know, I, I think trust as well is a really big issue. I don't think now going forward after the pandemic, working from home will ever be seen as a perk or, uh, you know, something that when you work from home, you don't do any work mm -hmm. because we've just, the world has just proven that you can be so much more productive mm -hmm. when you're equipped with the right uh, tools, equipment, and you're just equipped for success. So that's, that's really what I want to say. Don't forget everything we've learned. Listen to the people that are that are telling you that they need support um, and, and don't always look to apply a blanket approach. Mm -hmm. I know it's not easy to do like an individual thing for every single person, put in some great processes, talk to my colleague. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's not, it's not difficult. So, um, so post pandemic, sorry, Anna, I'm, I'm, I'm taking yeah. too much of your time, <laughs> but post, post pandemic, who, who are your, uh, the natural allies to disabled people within organizations? Is this an IT department who can say, hey, well, if they want to work flexibly, don't worry, we've, we've got it covered. Or is it an HR department to be more flexible about what targets they set in order to kind mm -hmm. of measure the success of an individual or productivity? Or is it uh, the, the executives who say, well, you know, we need a more engaging workforce, and if they have flexibility, then they'd be loyal. So what's your approach to making sure we keep that conversation alive and keep pushing this agenda all the time rather than just, you know, forget about it now that we've mm -hmm. achieved so far. Let's let's go on. Be happy with it. I think that's a good question. Martha. I think it's everybody's responsibility. I think senior leadership need to champion this and and show that they really mean it. If they do really say, you know, we can be flexible if you want to work from home I don't know, on a permanent basis and that's fine then then really mean it um I, because i think personally what i've seen is as soon as the government says oh get back into the workplace then employers feel that pressure as well so actually we have to recognize that organizations businesses and all and employers they're just still finding their feet in this as well and a lot of their practices that they would have done for years and years and years it's totally changed now so they're also trying to find a balance between you know what's financially viable what's um right for their people and right so they can continue delivering you know their services or products that they, they deliver so i i would say it's it's give and take on both sides but it, it's it's everybody's responsibility internally but i think if you have that clear senior uh champion and buy-in and 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 people can trust that they will be able to work from home or or tr or feel comfortable to say actually I, I, I want to work flexibly that that's that's really like game changing because there's so many people that are suffering in silence there are so many people as we know that have non-visible conditions that don't want to share that with their employer because i think it's going to have some sort of adverse effect mm. 
negative effect they might get fired yeah or... i see this is no different we, we also find i think i can say this correctly nasa that it, what we do which is provide solutions and um, productivity tools and understanding and sympathy mm -hmm. and empathy is you know if, if you look at the cost of an adjustment versus the cost of not providing one and the person not feeling uh, productive because they're not being taken care of it, it outweighs it i mean it's much more expensive to have somebody sit at home or go off sick long-term sick yeah. than it is to just spend that you know 500 pounds 250 whatever the, the money is and right. and and make that person you know comfortable and give them what they need it's so much cheaper and yet yeah. organizations think oh that's another thing we have to onboard and pay for but it's actually the opposite it's, well, it's the cost well, they are paying for it you're right anna they're paying for it but they, it's not visible uh, spend uh, mm -hmm. an interesting point you raised uh, shani about intersectionality and for example women are more likely like asian women more likely to die from COVID. We actually discovered in our data, which we've been working on thousands of cases over the past 12, 13 years, that around 70% of those who come for help, ask for help through their workplace adjustment programs, because we have about 40 clients across the different industries, mm -hmm. and 70% of them are women. We don't know why. We don't know, is it because uh, the health condition is um, obviously impacted more. Is it because they ask the more willingly, more readily? But we don't know. What I, that comes to is the fact that if there are certain minorities, like um, let's say Afro-Caribbean, maybe at higher risk of mental health, especially if there are women who have a higher risk of having health issues, mm. and if the companies are not providing those interventions, adjustments, then these people are doubly disadvantaged. So mm -hmm. if there are, there's a pay gap for women and they're also suffering more because of their health condition mm -hmm. and they're not getting the uh, adjustment, then how is that impacting on their future progression and, and, and the pro prospects? So you're very right. The in, in inclusion is not just about disability. It's about all of this working together in a very complex um, mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, I think... I think it's really important, you know, data is, is the key, isn't it? So, you know, with this data now, organisations, and especially the clients that you work with, they could perhaps do some more um, targeted messaging and comms around that fact. But I think um, my my opinion is, is and, and especially from working um, as a workplace adjustment specialist, I think there is a bit of a stigma amongst men not asking for help, uh, or, or sometimes it's not even knowing what exists or, or what people might need. And, you know, I used a wheelchair for the first 16 years of my life. So when I went into the workplace, I actually had no idea about what adaptions were available, what I needed. I didn't know I could get a bespoke chair made to my, my height. Uh, a footstool and suddenly like I was I'd gone from being very uncomfortable to being comfortable but I didn't want to make a fuss I didn't want to be seen as someone who was asking for more stuff because I had it was so difficult for me to even get my first job so then you know there's then, then that fear sets in it's like oh I just should be grateful I've got a job then maybe I shouldn't ask for more things but I think that's why it's really important especially organization to, to really you know want their employees to feel comfortable to have a level playing field to, to be able to thrive at work they need to understand that these are the fears that some of their people might be experiencing um, uh, so I think it's about understanding that understanding which types of groups are being served are taking up those options and actually are coming forward to say I need this help but also looking out to the ones that aren't as well. Mm -hmm. that's a great, yeah, that's point. True. great point. So we've got now disrupting disability. You are disrupting the world <laughs> of disability on many fronts. Can you tell us what keeps you motivated and why you're advocating in this space? Yeah, um, there's a lot of reasons. And I think a lot of it comes down to 
my own lived experiences and, and again you know I'm going to say that's me as a South Asian woman who experiences disability so you know um, just growing up I people would have a lot lower expectations for me as they would you know their, their own children or other children in the community um, people were shocked that I wanted to work some of the comments that were said to me is like, well, you don't have to work. You can claim disability benefit. Like it's given out like smarties and like it's that <laughs> easy to get. Um, and I was just, I just couldn't fathom why someone would say that to me. That's, that's. Also, also that you, why wouldn't you want to work? Exactly. And I was like, no, I want to contribute to society. What am I going to learn? Yeah. Just being at uh, home and not doing uh, anything. I think sometimes these um, acts, uh, which is totally ignorant way of doing it, is com comes out of kindness. Yeah. They think they are doing something kind, like keeping you in a hospital so you yeah. don't go out and break your legs, that yeah. kind of a attitude. Yeah. So yeah, I, I okay. I'm, I'm glad we moved from that kind of a society. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of it does have to do with culture, with education, with community. Mm. I know I remember when people reach and I learned how to drive when I went to you, but they're just shocked at bloody everything that I do. And I'm just like, well, why? They must have why? Blown away now. Yeah. And, and actually, yeah, and, and it's really funny because when I look now, I've achieved a lot more than other people who don't have a condition, yeah. you know, amongst my peers or my cousins or whatever. And it's like, well, you know, do you still do you still view disability as something that can hold somebody back? You know, so I just I just want to change people's mindsets and I know I can't do it on my own and I don't want to do it on my own. And this is why I talk so much about how much is everybody else's responsibility. But and I just imagine if I don't know, I don't know where I got my courage from. I don't know, I don't know why when the whole everything around me was telling me to do one thing, but I just did completely something else. Mm -hmm. And that courage had had to come from somewhere. Um and I think if I don't know, maybe if I was different and I'd listened to those people that had said, don't work, don't drive, don't do this, rely on your mum and dad forever, live with your mum and dad until you die. <laughs> like, you know, what kind of life is that? Like, what if, what if, what if that, that's all I believe that I could ever be or do? How sad is that? That like, this is, this is what motivates me because I never saw people like me or, or disabled people doing great things growing up, apart from the Paralympics, which was, even less of a thing when I was growing up. But then equally, not all disabled people want to be athletes. Like, you know, that's why I think it's really important that we have accurate and authentic portrayal um, and representation. So that's what keeps me motivated. And, um, and because I really believe that a change, change can be made. I've already seen amazing change happen, slow, uh, I need it to be quicker, um, but we, you know, we've all seen, um, I think, a, a shift in perceptions over the last couple of years. Yeah, and definitely. I think, especially because people have social media and they can put out their own narrative, they can own their own media, and I think that is amazing. So, next one. Um, I know that you've been working to launch a discount platform for disabled people. Have. Can you tell us how you're using technology to disrupt disability? Yeah, so this this was an idea that I had actually when I was doing my dissertation like over 10 years ago, but I just felt that the time wasn't right then. Nobody was talking about disability in society. But essentially, I just thought, well, disabled people face so many unavoidable extra costs due, due to living with a conditional impairment. And some research by Scope has estimated that extra cost to be £583 a month. Wow. That's a lot of money. It is. And I thought, well, hang on. Well, disabled people are twice as likely to be unemployed, have to apply for 60% more jobs. And then, you know, like me, if you're a woman, you might get paid less than your male, male, male counterparts. I mean, I don't know if I am, but we know there's a big gender pay gap, right? Um, and then there's also an ethnicity pay gap. Then there's also a disability pay gap. So that's trying to get a job. Then that's if you ever get a job. Then we know that if 
you are eligible for any type of uh, welfare support, it doesn't come close to meeting the extra cost. It's just this vicious cycle that keeps going round and round and round. And I thought, well, who's doing anything to tackle the root cause of the problem? Nobody. So I thought, okay, why don't I try? Um, I have no experience in business or technology, but boy, have I learned a lot on this journey. Um, so I started about two years ago, uh, pitching for investment, going out there, speaking to retailers, and I'm really happy to share that I, we're launching this year. We have got some incredible launch retailers, um, and I've got thousands of people on the waiting list. Um, so it's called diversability, and I chose the word because I felt that diversity and ability is never talked about in the conversation of disability. Mm. So I, I made my own word up, I trademarked it, um, and well now it's a couple of months off launch. So um, yeah, I, I, I just I just want people to have an equal chance at having some financial stability because I know what it's like to not have that. And, you know, I'm sitting here, I've, I'm just thinking about the five grand I've got to fork out now for my next wheelchair. Um, it, it just never ends. It never ends on top of the, 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 the monthly extra costs. So, um, you know, I just, I, just, I just wanted to help people. And I just thought that this was a great way to do that. So, yeah. So Virgin Media. I remember inviting you to one of our events that we had with Major Mandy uh, Islam in London, yeah. which is when I first met you, and you also met NASA and V. Um, you were working at Virgin Media and really wanted to expand their workplace adjustment offering. Yeah. You were instrumental in, in introducing Microlink, and in late 2019, everything took off and our partnership was formed. Yeah. Virgin Media have gone on to win awards for their dedication and efforts towards providing workplace adjustments. And they have been really, really, I mean, they went from zero to nothing, you know, to, yeah. to an explosion. And they really, really are a great company um, with taking care of their staff. So if there's anybody here wanting to do something similar in their own organisations, what advice can you give? Um. So yeah, you're right, Anna. We went from zero to 100. Um, we, we knew that after um, uh, um, an audit across the business that there was a really inconsistent approach to workplace adjustments. Mm -hmm. And depending on, on the line manager, their experience, their knowledge of adjustment would depend on the experience that um, the, the pe people were having across the business. And obviously, that's just not not what we wanted no. so I actually started for a good year and a half trying to centralize the process on my own for 13,000 people which is why I've got gray hair uh, no, we um, but we just needed a date we just needed some data we needed to try and understand what was being requested how was it being requested how was it being implemented what did this cost what was the case duration how were we acquiring the how we were procuring the equipment um, and actually what we found was really surprising. Um, a lot of adjustments didn't really cost a lot, if anything. Um, we, we were heavily reliant on access to work. We've now moved away from that. Now we, we work closely with Microlink, but I have to say, you just come in and just taken that burden off us. Um, mm. And you, you know, it, it's a beast. Workplace adjustment, depending on the size of your organization, mm. it can be this uncontrollable beast. Uh, and it's impossible to get your arms around it. But I have to say that, you know, working with, with yourselves and you working with all of our internal stakeholders from, you know, procurement, health and safety, IT, facilities, security, everybody, it's just really come together and we we were really shocked at how many people then came forward to get support but it just goes to show that our people needed that support but didn't know how to get it didn't know where to go to it was a really clunky process um so yeah and my only advice really would be starting out on this journey is you've got to be brave you've got to be bold and you've got to start somewhere mm. So within Virgin Media, we have had a massive focus on disability, which is why, um, you know, I have the time to um, get the data, 
it, it was going hand in hand with a lot of the work that we were doing. Yeah. And I know that other organisations might not have that opportunity. But I think this is, on our disability inclusion journey, this is one of the main uh, key turning points that I think that we, we, we implemented because it's the biggest barrier to your people coming in and doing their job. So I think you have to prioritize workplace adjustments really high up on that list. Um, and, and I think, you know, yes, you can do it on your own, but it's really difficult. My personal advice would be is to work with an organization like Microlink. They are experts in this. They will teach you everything you don't know about it. Um, and, 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 and it's going to be cheaper for you as an organization and the data that you get you, the turnaround time we would never have been able to do that internally um so yeah it look it's not always been easy not because of anything on microlink side because we're changing hearts and minds internally um it, it, it you know it's not always easy to do that but once you get everybody onto the same page um then then you're away and there's no stopping yeah, well, that's exactly uh, what's happened uh, isn't it i mean the media's the, the, actually uh, we have to move to questions and answers but there was uh, yeah. one point you made um shani i used to think cost was a barrier to organizations until we discovered companies do spend a lot more on disability but they get they don't get the right outcomes because they're not all aligned they're really spending so much time and effort, lots of people's time as well, and not getting the results. Hence, they kind of think it's not going to work. Yeah. However, when you bring everyone together and they're on the same page, they're working towards the same goal, you find the cost is the least of their worries because it's so little. But what makes the big difference is confidence. You actually give the employees the confidence that the employer cares. That's what they come forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And thank you for your help throughout this um, journey, because obviously uh, it takes a visionary to make that bold move. And once others buy into that uh, dream, then quite frankly, it becomes business as usual. And people wonder why we hadn't done it before. But I think we need to move on to some questions. Helen. Yeah, we've got, I, I we've got a few questions here. Um, got one from Nick Robson. What do you think we can do to promote more visibility and understanding without accidentally positive discriminating people? Hmm. Mm, that's a tricky one. Yeah. Yeah, I get where that's coming from because I think a lot of, yeah, and I've actually heard this quite a lot actually, you know, people don't like positive discrimination or people are like, well, you can't treat somebody more favorably, but actually, I think the best thing to do here is, is awareness and education about systemic barriers. Because if people don't understand that systemic barriers are holding people back, whether it's about disability, whether it's about ethnicity, gender, it could be any age, you know, take any of the diversity stands. I think it, it, it comes back to education and awareness. And, you know, then if people are still a bit hesitant or uh, maybe not on the same page, um, to, to work on this to be more inclusive then I just think you've got some really mean people <laughs> um, but no I think I think the key as well just to, just picking up the point about um, without being accidentally uh, accidentally positive discriminated I think just be really authentic um, don't talk on behalf of the people that you're trying to uh, advocate for invite them to that space invite them to share their stories that is the most powerful thing and and you know it's the thing that i always do um when i work with organizations it, it's sharing those stories and it doesn't always have to, let's let's take disability for an example it doesn't always have to be a disabled person sometimes you might want somebody else talking about their experience with disability i don't know how they learned about it things that they didn't know or an experience maybe an awkward experience that they have been in that they learned from because that's really powerful as well. Mm. So yeah, I, I think positive discrimination has this sort of negative connotation, but mm. I think if people actually understood the systemic just barriers, keep it real. yeah, just you know, I think uh, that's what I would. That's what I would say. We have another question from Elsena. I hope I said that right, Elsena Jeffers. Do we have an example of a filled in self assessment form to share as an example of how a disabled person can gain? used to gain employment by knowing 
the law, what, what the law said and that, what they may be entitled to. So do we have an example of a fit? Is there a, a self-assessment form, NASA? Do we know of? Is there anything like that? That's a uh, declaring disability. Uh, it's a um, tough one because disclosure, um, it can be quite a uh, meaningless exercise, if, in my opinion, in, in my years of working with so many employees. Two types of uh, situation will uh, reduce uh, disclosure. One, when the employee is very inclusive, and the other one, when the employer is not inclusive at all. Because the first uh, situation, people say, well, if my condition doesn't stop me doing my job effectively and efficiently, I mean, I have all the help I need in order to do my job, I have all the adjustment, then why would I need to tell the employer I'm disabled? It's only statistics. Mm -hmm. And if you are a kind of employee who works in a company that is not doing what you know, uh, disability smart employers do, uh, is no, no, no provisions for adjustment, then they say, what's the point of telling them other than wanting to sue them or try to take them to some sort of tribunal? So you'll find that people with conditions will happily do their job if they don't need to raise that flag that I'm disabled, which is like a, a sign of a true inclusive society. So I think uh, where you come across employment applications for a job, do you need to disclose your disability? That's where the problem lies with a lot of uh, candidates because they don't know the employer. It's a big risk, as you mentioned, it took so many efforts in their attempts to get a job. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to ruin it by telling someone, I have additional needs? And that is really a very real question. Well, I mean, is, is there any example of a field in self-assessment form? Is there a form that exists? Not that I know of. No, not, no. Well, anyway, Alsena, we will send you some, some resources after, the, after this um, webinar and maybe, maybe you'll find something there. And by all means, drop us an email and we'll try and help yeah. you. And, and look, sure. look up things like the guaranteed interview scheme, make sure that you tick that box, you know, if you um, want to be part of that process, look up um, the disability confidence scheme, there's a whole list of employers, microlink up part of that as well, um, look up access to work, so there are, there are different things out there, but I don't know of a sort of a self-assessment as such. Mm. Mm. I think, I, th I think they just wanted to see something already filled in because obviously to try and help them gain employment. Um, uh, details of the government disability unit, please. Um, uh, you, I think you mentioned something earlier about the, you, you yeah. were doing something with government and- the cabinet office. Asked. That's right. So yeah, it's, it's the disability unit in the cabinet office who yeah. are currently working on the national disability strategy. Um, so I am a regional stakeholder for London, so I represent the voices of disabled people and their organisations to that. Um, I, it, it's not something, it's not a physical place where you can go or anything, but, you know, we, we recently saw that uh, the, the strategy asked people to share their views, uh, but just go on the website, if you, you can mm. Google it, um, mm. yeah. Um, can I plug in a... Um a message from Center for Social Justice. They did a report which was yeah. published last week and we were a proud sponsor of that report because we've been working, contributing to it. And I think that's a fantastic report. It's a kind of a roadmap what the government's future policy should be towards disability and inclusion. So I think uh, the more people know about that report, the better. It's yeah. some fantastic recommendations. And I'll I think share it with everyone um, when, yeah. when we send the recording, the resource page. We'll, and and we'll I guess what, Shani's, Shani's picture is in it as well. I don't know how she found us. Yeah, your, way into your picture's in there too. I told you, you're everywhere. Yeah. Everything I look at. I remember going for, down um, in the London Underground, you know, when you were first doing the LinkedIn. And I, and I totally just met you. And then I look at it. Oh my goodness, there's Shani. Yeah. And everywhere I went were these massive billboards with your face. Oh, it's very interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this girl? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She's everywhere. <laughs> she is omnipresent, as I said. <laughs> so you're, um, you're like, do, we, do we have any more questions? No, I think that's it for the moment. There is, anyway, uh, we're, right, we're bang on time, so fantastic. Yeah, and I, I would, have a coffee. I would like to take the opportunity for, uh, to thank all the participants. It's been a great session with Shani, and, and we do want to thank our captioning people, my clear text, they're amazing resource to have. So 
um, thank you to their to their efforts and to their work. And I hope everyone found this very uh, productive uh, hour. Um, we will send you further information. Obviously, you have our details. If there is anything specific, please do write in, and we will respond very quickly. Meanwhile, um, um, we look forward to um, the blogs that Shani writes for us once in a while. And so um, thank you very much for being with us today, Shani. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and, and, and thank you, everyone. So spot on one hour finish. Yes. <laughs> Time flies. I will spend a few you. hours more with you, Shani. So a high five from me to you. Thank you for your. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, Shani. It was brilliant. Very passionate. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And we'll see everybody next week. Yeah, next Thanks. week is who is next week? Nancy. Dr. Nancy, Nancy Doyle. Doyle. So uh, next week Nothing. is extremely, it's a very good uh, topic next week. Neurodiversity is yep. really um, uh, quite now out in the public and people are now finding that subject very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Certainly uh, so much potential for us to make our workplaces even better. Remote working, people with neurodiversity can be great, creative, and resilient people to have. So Nancy is probably one of the best known people out in the neurodiversity world, and we are so proud that she's going to be with us next week. So hopefully we'll see you all next week again. Look forward to it. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.